Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is Rafael Romo, and I'm an anchor and correspondent for CNN based out of Atlanta. It is my honor and my pleasure to be here today. Thank you very much to all of you for being here. And I wanted to especially thank the uh, Dubai Chamber for organizing this wonderful event. Also would like to thank uh, our friends at the uh, Inter-American Development Bank uh, for helping coordinate this event and of course, uh, last but not least, the government of Panama for uh, putting this together. And I also want to mention and thank my friends at The Economist who have been so cordial and so nice with me. Um, the leader that I would like to introduce to you is someone who really needs no introduction. He comes from the private sector, so in many respects he speaks the language that you speak, and he has been where, where you are right now. And that's why I wanted to, that's what we wanted to talk to him, but at the same time he's been in the public sector for the last 15 years, first as a leader of a local party, uh, then as vice president and foreign minister, and for the last five years as the president of the Republic of Panama. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome His Excellency, the president of the Republic of Panama, Juan Carlos Parilla. Mr. President, please have a seat. Thank you, Rafael. Thanks for that presentation. <laughs> and thanks to all the audience for being here today. And I just found out, Mr. President, that we actually have something in common I didn't know that I have any, anything in common with the president, but you, you and I both have lived in Atlanta. You lived in Atlanta for a while uh, when you were a student, uh, student at Georgia Tech. That's correct. Uh, you're an engineer as well? That's correct. And I'm an engineer. I'm trained to solve problems, so I don't create. I like to solve problems. <laughs> That's right. And, and uh, I was making the point before that you have the unique perspective of seeing at world problems from both points of view, the private sector, because you come from the private sector and you had a very successful business career before you decided to enter politics, but you've also been in the public sector for the last 15 years. Uh, what can you tell us about the transition from the one to the other and how has that helped you lead the country in a different direction? Well, I was born in 1963 when I was uh, 14 years old the whole region of Central America was engaged in civil war, Nicaragua, El Salvador, Guatemala. So I was raised with the image of young kids with, at 14 years old with assault rifles killing each other. So that made a strong impression on myself and I say, this will never happen in my country and I will be involved someday in public life to stop this from happening. So at the end, is pub public and private sector is the same. It's serving your country, serving your people, creating wealth, creating prosperity, creating opportunities. On the public sector side, you know, you have more resources from the government and you're able to solve more problems. So now I'm staying in the, in the public sector. I'm not going back to the private sector because after all these people that I met, all the problems that I've seen worldwide, I think I have to stay in the public sector helping. Uh, many in the audience know already that Panama is holding elections in less than a month on May 5th and your term is coming to a close at the end of uh, June, actually July, you're still going to be a president in July. Do you feel that you were able to accomplish everything um, in terms of economic prosperity and attracting investment to Panama that you set out to accomplish when you first took possession as president? Oh, for sure. In the past uh, five years, Panama has a stable economic growth of 5% average. Last year was a difficult year because there was a strike on the construction uh, side of the side of economy, and also we decided to stop uh, immigration from Venezuela coming to Panama. We established visa, and from 2012 to 2016, immigrants from Venezuela brought a lot of economic growth to Panama. They brought resources, but I, we have to stop it because we received 100,000. It was not an easy year, but the forecast for 2019 is 6% growth. One of the highest growth in Latin America. We are going about to open a copper mine. It's very linked to my public career because I went to Japan in 2009 and was able to raise $1.5 billion from Singapore and from Korea for that project. Mm -hmm. So you see the results 10 years after. So I think my administration will be understood by everybody some years from now. I'm just, I sent 6,000 teachers to the United Kingdom, Canada and the United States. So we have a bilingual education 
system in our country that will be seen in 10 years from now, not just three months from now. And if you allow me, I would like to remember the members of the audience that if you have a question for President Barella, you will have an opportunity to do so. We have uh, set up uh, four microphones. So there's one on that side, one in the middle, one in the back, and one uh, on my left. So if you have a question uh, later on the program, I'll give you an opportunity to do so. Uh, Mr. President, decades ago, there was only one player in the region, the United States. Nowadays, it's uh, a more diverse scenario. Uh, we were talking about this before. You were just in China, uh, in Hong Kong. You uh, uh, have met with leaders of other parts of the world. Panama is attracting investment, not only from the United States, but from uh, the Arab world as well. Many of the members of our audience come from, from the UAE. Uh, and I wanted to ask you, is this a way of saying adios to the United States and hello, Arab world, CNN, Hello, China. <laughs> love. <laughs> you love that. This uh, no. Look, uh, I think that I have changed the foreign policy of my country. Usually, Panama and many Latin American countries will look just America, North America, Europe, Japan, Korea. But I changed that. Uh, I established diplomatic relationships with China in 2017. I went to Dubai, and just this week, as we speak here, we have the Global Business Forum here today the president of China Eastern coming on Thursday, trying to bring a flight from uh, Shanghai to Panama, the, the chief of UNODC, the United Nations Regional Agency Against Drugs. So tomorrow we have, an, so I have changed that. We are approaching more China, India, uh, Dubai, the Middle East, Africa. Uh, I'm opening, uh, as I mentioned in my speech, embassies in Jor Jordan, Australia, Ethiopia. So I think we, are, we live in just one war, six billion. Uh, people live in this, and there are enough resources in the planet for everybody. So I think that Panama, that has the Panama Canal, the connectivity, a service-based economy is key. We need to talk to everybody. And we, ha we don't have to talk to other countries through other countries. We can talk direct. And that's the problem, that some countries want you to go through them so you can talk to, to others. It's not like that. We are a sovereign country, and we have the right to, do, to have a relationship with any country. And I think that we have taken a lot of advantage of this policy. We have bring a lot of foreign investment to Panama. I just gave the example of the copper mine, one billion from Korea and 500 million from Singapore. That's linked to two trips that I did when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs to Singapore and to South, and to South Korea and bringing the first president of South Korea to Panama. As the same, the same I did with China. I brought the first time a Chinese president visited Panama was during my, administra my administration. So it, it changed everything. So now Panama has more than 150 multinational companies establishing their regional headquarters in Panama and from Panama expanding their business to the region. Why? Because of our laws and our foreign policy. Is that a model that you think uh, other countries in the regions should follow? Because sometimes uh, it seems like one country has to make a decision from to, to play ball, so to speak, or to do business with one country or the other. I am not going to mention the obvious here, but everybody in the audience know, knows what I'm talking about. Is, is this a model that should be replicated? For, for, for sure. The One China policy was supported and decided by the United States 40 years ago. It was President Nixon and Secretary of State Kissinger that they opened a relationship with China. How can you tell a country like Haiti that they cannot have a relationship with China when China is investing $20 billion around six Caribbean countries around Haiti? It doesn't make any sense. So you are trying to use a small country that needs foreign investment for a geopolitical issue. That doesn't make any sense. It's not fair. So I think if the United States supported the One China policy 40 years ago, why they can go to, with what moral authority can they go to a country to that say you cannot do it? Doesn't make any sense. We, we have a very strong ties with the United States. Security, all our agencies work very closely with US agency. We are the only Latin American country that joined the coalition against ISIS. We support the United States in all these tensions with North Korea, with Iran. We fight drug trafficking side by side with them. We have a lot of cooperation in the border with Colombia. We all of our airports are work very closely with U.S. agencies to avoid terrorism, to affect those. But on the other side, China is the second largest economy in the world. It's the second user of the Panama Canal. So, and that's the reason why we are having also this event here. When I went to Dubai, and I always mention this, and I was sitting at the Dubai Mall, and in a restaurant, I saw you know all these thousands of tourists. Nobody's waiting for anybody here. We should just be one war, 
and making sure that the resources of the planet give a, a better life to everybody that lives in it. What would you tell to a member of the audience who's uh, listening to this conversation right now and uh, they're thinking about investing in the region but they don't quite know if they should come to Panama, if they should go to Colombia, if they should go to Mexico, some of the other countries, obviously you're biased, but give us some of the reasons in terms of political certainty, uh, institutional independence, uh, some of the things that investors look at because they wanna know that if they come with a big investment to the, reason, to, to the region, they want to know that if there's a new government, and as I said before, P Panama is having elections in less than a month, that whatever policies that you espoused of having open markets are not going to change with the next president. So what would you like to tell them? Well, this is a regional forum, so I would like to give some advice regional. Wait some time before investing in Venezuela. You have to wait a couple of years, but it will be a good country in the future. I think that there will be a change there. But the region is going through very important changes, democracy, you know, is fighting back, is getting uh, freedom, accountability. The citizens are empowered with, with social media, and that's positive. Talking about my country, you know, fastest growing economy in the region, uh, stable country, rule of law. You know, and to be honest, I just came from the United States, and, and in the United States, the president can do fundraising for his party, for his uh, people. For, he can even go to rallies. I don't do that here. I'm just uh, 30 days away from an election in Panama, and I'm not part of the campaign because I'm trying to build a stronger democracy for my people. So I think that Panama is, is a very good place to invest. And just talk to the countries and the companies that have invested in Panama. All the American companies like AES, energy company, uh, talk to uh, First Quantum, Copper, copper Mine uh, from Australia, uh, talk to the Chinese companies that have established regional headquarters here. I mean, all the companies that invest in Panama that have been successful, there are many success stories in our country because of democracy, because of stability, the rule of law, and also because of our people. Because where there is conflict, where there is war, investment will go down, and the value of investment will go down. When you invest in a country peaceful as Panama, a country that you know, accepts all kind of people, culture, faith, and receive the, the visitors, like if they're locals, it's a, it's a positive country that is a very positive to invest. And also, we have the canal, the expanded canal, the investment in infrastructure by the government. We have invested more than $4 billion in massive transportation. We're about to invest another $4 billion in urban mobility, more than $6 billion in basic sanitation, water, housing for the people. So it's a, as you can see, this is a country that is moving forward and is bringing, as same as Dubai, we, we have received more than 400,000 immigrants in the past 10 years, allowing people to come and help us build a stronger and better country. There's been a, a tendency, Mr. President, in the region to rely a little too much on commodities and not develop the kinds of services that are driving today's economy. Uh, I can name many examples, but uh, the reality is that the, the, the world is moving towards the direction of providing more uh, services that are qualified, uh, technological advancements of the such. In the case of Panama, what can you tell us? Is Panama moving in the direction of creating opportunities, not only in, in terms of commodities, but more on the technological uh, side? I will sell services, logistics, connectivity. Air connectivity is very important for us. We just expanded the Panama Airport that is gonna go from 15 to 25 million passengers in 10 years. We just expanded the canal. We have a new port on the Pacific. It's a Singapore investment PSA. Uh, we are expanding our free zones. So I think that, that Panama is a service-based economy and I will keep like, it will keep like that. Tourism is, is gonna be very important for us too, but air connectivity, the expanded canal, logistic, moving cargo is gonna be very important. And also this new relationship with China and now with the Middle East and other regions is really gonna uh, bring a lot of prosperity for our people and for the region too. Wanted to remind the audience that uh, we have an opportunity for you to ask questions uh, directly to the president. I don't know if we have anybody who has signed up or, or has, uh, you just really need to stand up to the mic. The mic. Uh, no, is there the anybody at this point? Not yet, okay. Just wanted to put it out there in case somebody wanted to. Uh, we'll open it up when, whenever we have uh, somebody. Uh, who's who's ready? How do you see the the future, uh, Mr. President, in in ten years uh, for Panama? We were talking about the fact that 
there will be a change in presidency. Your party may or may not be part of the equation when all is said and done. Uh, but what is your hope, also reflecting on the fact that you're about to finish your, your five-year mandate? Well, if we see the main drivers of our economy, the expanded Panama Canal, Japan Energy depends on the LNG that goes from the U.S. Gulf Coast to Japan. So the expanded canal is really becoming more profitable every year. We have an issue that we have to support and strengthen the capacity of the lakes that support the Panama Canal to function with additional water from other sources. And I will say that that's one of the main challenges of my country in the short term period. But the expanded canal is doing well. $1.7 billion in net profit to the local, to the central government that allows us to do a lot of investment for our people, schools, hospitals, roads, new metros. Uh, tourism, we are about to open a new convention center just 30 days from now, a new cruise terminal on the Pacific side. Uh, we're going to be promoting Panama as a home port. We're going to allow crews that do home port in Panama to transit through the canal, sponsored by the Tourism Authority. Uh, the Cologne Free Zone, now with this new diplomatic relationship with China, is becoming a stronger ally of Asia to Latin America to import goods and re-export. Uh, I, I have to be honest, I learned a lot in Dubai. I changed my immigration policy after I, I saw how Dubai allowing Chinese tourists to travel to Dubai. I received more than 800,000. I did it with Cuba. Uh, to small Cuban businessmen that are more than 600,000, they can travel to Panama without a visa just presenting the ID card that they are small businessmen in Cuba. There are 600,000. Did you get any pushback on that, Mr. President, on allowing it, Cubans it, to travel? Directly? It went from 10,000 visits in three years ago. It's going to close in 100,000 visits this year. Small Cuban businessmen coming to the Colon Free Zone to buy goods, to renovate their homes, to renovate their restaurants. We have to support the policy of Cuba of opening their economy. We cannot, you know, we cannot impose political system. We have to defend human rights everywhere with every country, with Saudi Arabia, everywhere, but we cannot impose our political system to anybody. We have to defend human rights, that's one thing, but we should support Cuba opening its, its, its economy, the new constitution, and we should allow them to move forward, and we should bring them to, be, uh, to have a more constructive approach to the humanitarian crisis in Venezuela. So I will say that Panama, if you summarize the future of Panama, tourism, air connectivity, the canal, logistics, financial services. We have passed many laws to protect our financial system today. Probably I can say that in five years, we've been able to fix all the damage to what's, that it was done to our country because different situations with our financial system. So I think that Panama is going to grow 6% average in the next five years. There's going to be a transition. There's gonna, there are elections 30 days from now. A new president is going to be elected. There are strong institutions. Citizens will are empowered with social media and today, Politics in my country is a service, it's not a business. And if somebody tried to go back that politics is a business, then they will have to face justice. You mentioned it uh, briefly, and since you brought it up, I wanted to take advantage of the opportunity to ask you about the issue of immigration, which is, uh, in many respects, the elephant in the room right now for the region. And I'm talking about Venezuela. About three million people have left Venezuela already. And you suggested before that there will be, in your opinion, a, a change in government sometime soon, and not exactly, we don't know exactly when, uh, but you also suggested that Venezuela could be a great opportunity if the crisis right now is handled properly. Would you care to elaborate on that? For sure, I mean, we have to solve the situation in Venezuela. Venezuela is not an economic, political, or social crisis anymore. It's a humanitarian crisis. There are four million, same, same, same amount of people that left Syria, have left Venezuela. Four million people, and they're living with no resources, with no hope. And that's not right. President Duque has one million Venezuelans living in their country. We have to fix the situation in Venezuela through dialogue. There's a president that his term is over. Now he's a former president. He was elected until January 10, 2019. He's not a dictator. He's not a king. He's not, he, he was elected in, in a democratic election. He has to leave. And there's a new president, interim president, elected by Congress, who is the authority of the country now, that must call for new elections as soon as possible. But we have to solve this in a way that we can, with dialogue, with peace. We need a diplomatic, peaceful, and Venezuelan solution. The problem is that if we try to use Venezuela for a fight between these big powers or a geopolitical conflict, that will be a big mistake. Because it will delay the solution to the Venezuelan problems, and the ones that are suffering are the Venezuelan people. So I think that Venezuela is not about Nicaragua, Cuba, Russia, China. Venezuela is about Venezuela. 
29 million Venezuelans, and the only medal by solving the, pro the problem in Venezuela must be for the Venezuelan people, because they are the ones that are suffering. So uh, I mean, Panama is part of the group of Lima. We support President Guaido. I just came back from Japan. I talked to Prime Minister Abe about it. I talked to the Chinese authority about Venezuela. And we need a more constructive approach by everybody. If we use Venezuela as a conflict between the United States, China, Russia, that's not fair with the Venezuelan people. This is about Venezuela. And we need to solve with dialogue in a peaceful way and, and through the democratic rule. But would you say, Mr. President, that the risk of a proxy war is, is there, at least, that uh, something similar to what's happened in Syria may also happen in Venezuela? No, we're totally against that. I don't, see, I don't see any kind of military intervention that won't, won't be supported by all the countries. The 54 countries that recognize President Guaido, I don't see the countries, uh, including the United States, supporting any, any use of force. But if the, presi if the former President Maduro decides to go against President Guaido, then the 54 countries must react in some kind of way because we have to uh, respect democracy. You cannot take hostage or put in prison and a president that is recognized by 54 countries and is the, the, the authority in that country now. And he's fighting, he's a brave kid, John, and he, he's really a leader that is fighting for his people. He's risking a lot. His chief cabinet is in prison for the past three weeks and he, they are there, they're fighting and, they're, and I think there will be a solution to this problem. And there's a strong message to the Venezuelan regime now that they cannot, they cannot do anything against him. If they do something, then the 54 countries must react. No takers, some questions yet? You're way too quiet. Would you come, come up to the microphone, please? Uh, the gentleman in the back was the first one to raise his hand. There's a microphone right there. Yes. Uh, please identify yourself and uh, say the question. Hello. Oh. Hi, Mr. President. Uh, my name is Federico Mieta. I work for a brokerage dealer here in Panama. I um, just wanted to ask a question about, well, going back to the tourism part about the possibility that there would be for Panama to try to help the tourism industry by, um, I wouldn't say lobbying, but try to attract certain big, big name um, tourism industry participants as Disney World or uh, some other kind of uh, big company like that. That would, you know, make much, a lot of sense as Panama is a central country and, you know, tourists from, from uh, Latin America wouldn't have to apply for a visa to the United States and actually make it to Panama. Well, I, I will say that, that to be able to compete with that market, uh, the first thing for us will be a cruise terminal that we're building on the Pacific side. So we can, if we can move passengers from doing home port in, in Florida, doing home port in Panama, not just moving that business from Florida to Panama, it's bringing new business because as you mentioned, not, a, not, a, not all Latin American tourists can go to board a, a cruise in Miami, not all Asian tourists or European tourists can go to Miami to board a cruise. So I will say that, I mean, building a facility like this or something that takes time, takes planning, we have the land, we have investors, but that takes more planning. I will say that the, a quick win for us will be this September when we open our cruise terminal that we allow the, 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 do we have reservations for more than uh, 65 chips that are going to do port of call in Panama? But home port is a big business. So signing an agreement before I leave office where we uh, send a strong message to the, the companies that we will pay the transit through the canal because the time, the, the season for the cruise is when we have enough water in the lakes, September to February. At this time, it's not easy for us because now we are in April. We don't have, don't have enough water, but during the season of the cruises, September to January, February, we have enough lake in the, in the waters of the canal. So allowing them to, to transit through the canal and the, the, the state sponsor the transit to bring home port to Panama, that will be a quick win for us that can bring 300,000 tourists. By the way, we have talked to MSC Cruise Line and probably they will open uh, uh, 2021 with a ship here in Panama on the Pacific side. And you can go to the Caribbean, uh, using the, the Pacific side of Panama and this new terminal. So I would say that the opportunity that I see is this cruise terminal and the convention center, and also the advantage of having Copa Airlines in Panama and the new airport, and also the connection of the metro with the city. That is, you, can, you will be able to come from Panama Airport to Panama City for just $1 in 30 minutes. That's a big advantage because you can go from the airport to the city in just 30 minutes for $1. That will be a, a, a good proposal for the tourists. 
Thank you very much for your question. Thank there you. was another gentleman right there. Go ahead. ¿Qué tal? Buenos días. Le saluda Giancarlo Carrión. Quería hacerle una consulta referente a las tecnologías. ¿Qué oportunidades encontramos, digamos, para los empresarios que vienen a Panamá para constituir una empresa específicamente en tecnología, startups, aplicaciones móviles? ¿Qué oportunidades hay para el empresario para conseguir capital de riesgo para poder invertir en esas tecnologías? Ya que en América Latina, en Panamá, en diferentes países, se está empezando a desarrollar una nueva tendencia de nuevos unicornios en tecnología. ¿Qué oportunidades un empresario puede encontrar acá en Panamá? The question well, pertains, excuse me, Mr. President, the question pertains to investors who are interested in mobile technologies that are willing to come to, uh, Latin, Amer to Latin America, specifically to Panama, Mr. President. Well, I will say that we have a very creative, aggressive, uh, liquid financial center. So you will have the, a lot of support from the banks. You need to, to, to put a, a good case, but you will get any entrepreneur in Panama that comes with a business, you will get a lot of support from the financial center system in Panama because you have a lot of uh, 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 leaders in the financial center, banks that are looking for opportunities to be part of that, also investors. There are many investors, people that are, have, uh, a company was sold here for $1.4 billion. Uh, a cable company was sold to, to Millicom last month. Uh, just three companies, Panamanian companies, were sold last year for more than $2 billion. So you have a lot of private investors that have all that liquid assets that will be looking forward to invest in new opportunities. Plus, also the Panamanian banks and international banks over here will support it. It's just putting a strong case together and a good, a good business case together. Gracias por su pregunta. Tenemos otra. We have another question at the other end of the room. Go ahead, please. Muchas gracias. Eh, un cordial saludo, Presidente Carlos Varela y a toda la audiencia. Eh, quería consultarle y pedirle un poco si puede ahondar darnos en mayor información acerca de cómo fue el proceso de la creación y el, la habilitación de la embajada en China, la relación diplomática con China continental, teniendo en cuenta la amistad de muchos años con Taiwán, el impacto del proceso de la decisión política y cuál es el impacto económico que se espera dentro de ese nuevo acuerdo. Paraguay, en América del Sur, es un país que actualmente también está llevando adelante el, el mismo proceso quizás y quisiéramos conocer un poco más acerca de su experiencia. And would you identify yourself, please? ¿Cuál es su nombre? Carlos Núñez, eh, diputado nacional de Paraguay. Gracias. Gracias, bienvenido. The question pertains to uh, Panama's decision to move its embassy from Taiwan to uh, Beijing and whether there has been any political repercussions for Panama as a country, Mr. President. Well, the same gaze, games that took place in Abu Dhabi last month took place in Shanghai in 2007, Special Olympics. So I went to Special Olympics uh, with my family in 2007, I, and I saw the impact of the opening of the Chinese economy to the war, and it was a very strong impact, so I was very impressed. And I went from Shanghai to Beijing. In Beijing, I met with the authorities of the party, of the lo local, the ruler party in, in China, and because of the impression that, that I got on that visit, I said, well, if I become the president of Panama, I will support the One China policy. So that's why I can talk about it openly, because I said that in 2007. So I've been quoting since 12 years ago in being a person that supported the One China policy. So when I became the president of Panama, I did what I promised that I was going to do 10 years ago. And I shake hand, and, and I didn't ask for anything from my country. To have the moral authority to be able to say whatever I want to say about any situation, talk about human rights, talk about uh, uh, any, any situ situation with China, with United States. So, Panama shake hand, I think, and we established a relationship. It was a very fast negotiation, and I think it was, it's going to be very positive for our country. Since that decision, many Chinese companies have established a regional headquarters in Panama, more foreign investment. They are using Panama. China is 17% of tourism worldwide. Just Dubai gets 800,000, and we received 12,000, 12, and now we're close to 35,000. So it has increased tourism to Panama in 200% or 250%. So, and they're bringing their companies, their executives are coming, they are bringing the, their, their, their use in our country and our laws, because the law 41 is the law that allows multinational companies to establish their United Corps in Panama, and then they can bring their executives. So I think it's a very positive decision, and they're the second largest economy. Mm -hmm. um, the U.S. is negotiating a new trade deal, probably it will be announced soon. So we have the right to, to, to have, we are negotiating a free trade agreement. Uh, Alberto is going to China, the Vice Minister of Commerce, uh, two weeks from now. Uh, to, to keep negotiating the free trade agreement. Uh, we were just allowed to export meat, uh, fish, and pineapples to China. 
even we're not as strong as per company, we are more like a service provider, but I think that China is seeing Panama as the gateway for Latin America, and that's the role that we're playing, not just for China, for Middle East countries, for Dubai. We're bringing countries together. We're bringing regions together, and that's the future. Mr. President, we have only a couple of minutes left, so thank you very much for those who participated in the question. I just wanted to ask you uh, to close. Um, we mentioned before that you only have less than three months in office. Uh, you've been in the public sector for about 15 years as a vice president, foreign minister, president of your party, and then president for the last five years. What's next for Juan Carlos Varela? Do we expect to see you back in the private sector? Do we expect to see you perhaps at the United Nations, at the Organization of American States? Uh, what no. can you tell us about uh, the future uh, of Juan Carlos Varela? I, I like to be a peacemaker. You know, after watching an opera concert next to Vladimir Putin for two hours in the Red Square, and then uh, having lunch a couple of times with Vladimir Poroshenko of Ukraine, just trying to, 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 to have them to talk and solve the conflict, you know, after meeting uh, so many leaders, I don't think it's fair to my people and to the opportunities that I've received from other countries to use all this network and all this contact for our personal purposes. So that's why I will stay in public life, uh, trying, trying to, to be a peacemaker. Where, where, where there is war, there is no progress. Where there is war, there is no business. Where there is war, there is no peace. So I like to be just a peacemaker. And, and, and as an engineer, I like to solve problems. So, and there are more problems <laughs> every day. People are creating new problems. And so we need somebody to solve them. So I would like to be a problem solver, not a problem creator. And it was very interesting, Mr. President, to uh, talk to you before. And you mentioned that you actually met Ted Turner personally, <laughs> the founder of CNN, and that you personally know his family. Uh, and yes. so it's, it's great to know that part of your history, that you live in Atlanta, yeah. when you, that you went to school there. Uh, that must have been quite an experience. Yes, L Laura has invited me a couple of times to Florida. I have time. I'm working probably as former president. I will have time to, to see Laura Turner again. She's a good friend. Uh, I met her Turner at that time. CNN was just starting. We used to go together to the baseball games. The Brave were not a good team at that time, so the <laughs> stadium was empty. But he did a great business like CNN, and that I think that CNN... Uh, brings us a lot of news worldwide, and, and we, can, we have to learn. And I have traveled to more than 100 countries uh, since I was minister, no, sorry, 60 countries, more than 100 trips since I've been minister of foreign affairs for two, two years and a half and president for five years. And I have learned a lot, learned from people, from government, from friends, from conflicts, and bringing best practices to my country is the best. Next week, on Monday, I will be narrating a new technical education facility in Panama for 5,000 students for bilingual technical education. And, and that was a $200 million investment following the Singapore model. And in that technical education, I will be training young Panamanian kids, 18 years old, so they can go and work with Emirates. <laughs> Mr. President. Because you need <laughs> para, para finalizar, quiero invitarlo a que vea Mirador Mundial en CNN en Español. Eh, es una invitación, <laughs> si me permiten hacer el comercial de una vez. Y quiero agradecerle una vez más por la oportunidad de la entrevista y por recibirnos también. I would like to invite you, Mr. President, if you have the opportunity to watch my show on CNN called Global Outlook. <laughs> and thank you very much again for hosting us and for, for the opportunity for this interview. Thanks a lot, Rafael, for this uh, interview and for also inviting me to your program and for the interview we're gonna, we're gonna do after this uh, interview. And thanks all of you for listening to me and for being here in Panama for this great event. And thanks once again to the Dubai uh, Chamber of Commerce for bringing all this nice people to my country so I can share with them the success story that we're building together. Thanks a lot. His Excellency Juan Carlos Varela, <laughs> President of the Republic of Panama. <laughs> and to close, I would like to thank again the Dubai Chamber of Commerce, the Inter-American Development Bank, and of course, President Juan Carlos Varela and the Government of Panama. Thank you very much, everybody, and enjoy the rest of the afternoon.